Edit audio. Hey, y'all. The W season may be over, but we have a little something special for you as we head into the holiday season. I got a chance to sit down with Robin Hopkins, host of Well Adjusting, another Edit Audio original podcast. On Well Adjusting, Robin invites guests on to get into the nitty gritty of their problems and help them see things differently. Not in a therapy way, but more in a conversation and drinks with friends way. In this crossover episode you're about to hear, I hop back into my therapy bag to talk surviving the holidays with family. Robin and I get into how to avoid turning back into childhood versions of yourself. Triggers, glimmers, and escapes. Shout out to them cousin walks. If you know, you know. (laughs) Whether you're spending the holidays solo, participating in your family's shenanigans, or just feeling the weight of seasonal affective disorder, I hope this episode will change the game for you. I was going home for the holidays, and it was the very first time I brought my first girlfriend to meet my mom. It was already a stressful situation, and we were sitting around dinner, and we were having chips and queso that my sister had made. We were playing cards, and things were getting weird. My mom started, like, pinching my sister, but, like, accusing my sister of being a horrible cards player. Things are getting ratcheted up. And all I know to do, because this is the first time my girlfriend is meeting my mom and my stepdad and my sister, is to just keep eating chips and queso. I'm eating chips and queso. And I'm talking about how this chips and queso is the best chips and queso I've ever had. This is really good. And I'm seeing my mom and I see the crazy eyes. She's got the holiday crazy eyes. And they're getting worse. And a a switch flipped. I could see it happen in her head. She stands up and she says, So, everybody loves this queso, huh? So I guess you don't want my pot roast. I guess you don't want my pot roast. She stands up. She walks over to the crock pot that has been, I mean, like the the pot roast smells are coming in and it's going to be delicious. And she takes the pot roast and she turns on the garbage disposal. And with a wooden spoon, she jams the pot roast down the garbage disposal. And all we hear is like, and we're going, mom, we love the pot roast. We're going to, we're going to eat the pot roast. And that's how that holiday went. Welcome to Handling the Holidays. You need this episode because... One time, the Thanksgiving after 9-11 found out my dad actually didn't perish when the towers fell because he showed up out of nowhere after not hearing from him and he was the security guard in the towers so we assumed the worst one time my mom decided that she was going to do an italian christmas she made shells cooked them really early burnt them got totally loaded passed out on the couch and her friend liz said robin she's just drunk One time my uncle told me that he's okay with gay men, but he's not okay with lesbians because they take up all of his women. That's right, folks. The holidays can be rough. But on today's episode, we brought in Dr. Money, who's going to help us all make the holidays not just tolerable, but maybe even, dare I say it, fun. So take it away, Dr. Money. Hey, everybody. My name is Montanique, or Dr. Money. I use her, she, hers pronouns. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist with a PhD in family therapy, but I'm also part of the Edit Audio fam and the host of Rebound Revolution. (laughs) We're going to have a lot of air horns in this episode, I can already tell. We are here because we have to talk about the tragedy, the trauma, the trials, the tribulations <laughs> that happen over the holidays. And listen, maybe there's three people out there that have lovely homes that they go home to for Thanksgiving and Christmas and whatever else you celebrate, but it was not mine. I can't speak for you, Dr. Money. Everybody out there wearing their matching pajamas with their family, <laughs> not my experience. <laughs> 
Well, let's talk a little bit about, because we, we have already referenced the fact that you have all kinds of degrees and I have none, but I got my life smarts. <laughs> yes. So like, why are the holidays so triggering? Oh my gosh. Um, there's so much I can say about this, but three things really come to mind. Like the holidays hit in the dead of winter, <laughs> like these winter holiday seasons. Mm-hmm. And that's a time where a lot of us experience sad seasonal affective disorder. (laughs) So seasonal affective disorder, also known as seasonal depression. Robin, you made a face just now. Are you familiar with sad? Because this is my sad lamp. (laughs) Yes. I have a sad, a desk sad lamp. Yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, Pro tip, buy those in the summer because very few people. Cheap discounts. Yes. Very few people uh, experience seasonal affective disorder in the summer, mostly because of vitamin D stuff. So those lamps go on sale and they're way cheaper in the summer months. So if you need one of those sun lamps, happy lamps, get it in the summer. Um, But yeah, it's just a really hard time of year because the sun goes away. We're cold. Our body needs more rest. We're like depleted in all these nutrients that mimic symptoms of depression anyway. So our mood just yeah. kind of tanks during this time of year. So that already sure kind of sets us up to not be in a good place during the holidays. <laughs> it's so funny because I always think of the holidays. I don't think of the the sad part, but I think of like, oh, I get time off. I'm going to be in my pajamas. But then it just never ends up being like that. It yeah. ends up being like all these requirements of me, like I got to be at some family party I didn't necessarily want to go to and then we have to go do your traditions of you know my wife and then we've got to do this and it's like it just feels like you're running around the whole time like it never is what I want it to be Mm. and I'm blindsided every year by the way yeah it sneaks up on you right what you just said also reminded me of like another thing I thought about about what makes the holidays so hard is that Well, two things. One, we're totally thrown out of our usual routines for better or worse, right? So maybe you have a whole bunch of time off of work, but that puts you outside of your like daily routine of like getting yourself up, showered, dressed, (laughs) Um, or you're working like double time because the pay is more. And so you're picking up those holiday shifts. Either way, it totally throws you out of your usual like day to day. And that is enough to be like dysregulated. The other thing I was thinking about, about what you said is that like, there's these, oh my gosh, I'm such a nerd. So there's these dominant narratives, (laughs) right? So this comes straight out of narrative therapy. I love narrative therapy because I think it has the most room for intersectional feminism. (laughs) Yeah. But what's narrative therapy? Oh, Oh my gosh, so narrative... I was, Steph, I was just pretending like I knew what it was. Yeah, no, that no, sounds great. I, oh, great. <laughs> now I get to nerd out. Okay, so narrative therapy is a school of therapy that um, believes that we are not problems. Problems are problems. And problems get constructed by these dominant classes, these people in power, these groups in power who force narratives of what our lives are supposed to look like onto us. So we have our Mm. local narratives, our own stories of our life that don't fit with these dominant narratives that the powers that be push on us. And that like distance between the two, the distance between the dominant narrative and our personal local narratives is what causes problems. So you're talking about the dominant narrative is Old Navy telling me me and my family should be in the matching pajamas. And my local narrative is me saying, those are too expensive, Maxine. You're the only one who gets just the pants. Exactly. And and then that's our... Yeah. And then I look at the pictures and go, why doesn't this match up? Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you think your family's picture is somehow less cute because y'all don't have the Old Navy matching pajamas. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because we're not models. Exactly. (laughs) Like there's that as well. Yes. Just like a constellation of models they're presenting to us as a family. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of conflict between our local narratives and the dominant narratives around holiday times. There's all Mm. these like ways that we get the message of what our holiday celebrations are supposed to look like, whether it's from like family tradition, religious tradition, cultural traditions, TV all the movies, like there's so many messages about what our holiday season is supposed to look like. And when it doesn't, we feel like it's our like issue, yeah. right? Like so we're doing something wrong. I was also thinking recently a lot about 
there's all these like family patterns and roles. I mean, both of my parents are dead. So when I go, I don't go home anymore. But when I did, it was like me and my sister were exactly how we were when I was 12 and she was 18. Mm. My mom was exactly how she was. Everybody steps into their role of who Mm. you were then, but you're not that person anymore. So it like, it feels like a setup for a lot of crap. Yes. I bet you have a better way of saying that. Uh, no, a setup for a lot of crap is a great way to say it because <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Um, you just made me think about family systems therapy. Not only are you familiar with like, okay, this is who I am in my family, but there's all these bids and pulls for you to continue to be that person from the people in yeah. your family who know you as that person. It's like really right. hard for systems to change, like to introduce yes. new information. You know, like a great example is um, my mom, I hear her talking to her friends or to my cousins or other people and she describes me as quiet. Nobody else <laughs> in my life. I have multiple podcasts, mom. Like I am not a quiet person. <laughs> not, like quiet is not something that other people in my life would describe me as. But Were you quiet when you were like five or something? I was never quiet. I don't characterization you know what I think it is it's that family role stuff right so it's like my youngest sister is like this artist who's like vibrant and creating constantly and my middle sister has always been the way more social one who had more friends than I did our whole life so somehow in that configuration of siblings I got the quiet sibling like oh you know she's quiet I'm like I'm definitely not quiet (laughs) I do think as a parent, sometimes it's like we want to put a label on our kid because it helps us like understand who they are and and what they are. But it's like sometimes it's like then I'm asking my kids if I do it to like then they start walking into it. And I'm like, ooh, did I just like narrow their choices? But in your story, I I was just thinking of like the person who – goes to therapy and works on themselves and then comes home. Yes. You're suddenly coming home a different person mm-hmm. and then everybody's looking at you like, well, what? Do, why aren't you taking the bait? If mm-hmm. I'm normally, I'm normally poking at you and you're not yep. taking, and then I think sometimes instead of it being like, oh, she's grown, mm-hmm. those people double down on coming at yeah. you because they, they're uncomfortable when the system isn't the same right. as it always was. Yeah. And I don't even know if they know they're doing it. Yeah, they don't know that they're trying to like, correct the family to what it used to be before like before anybody grew or changed I always get really curious in those moments I think um, asking questions has been my defense against uh, some of my aunties (laughs) so I think I used to blow up really quickly right like they say Mm -hmm. one thing and I'm right back to being the (laughs) person that they knew me as as a teenager um, but now I'm just like, uh, what made you ask that question? Or how did you, how did you come to think that's about it that a way? Good, that's such a good, that's so interesting. I will ask the fuck out of a question. And they, <laughs> and then they are left. What do they like, do? What do they do? Oh my gosh. Um, one of my aunts, she just like, kind of like stammers through. And I think at this point now <laughs> she doesn't ask, she doesn't like poke me anymore. You know, she doesn't do those like baiting me to be yeah. teenage Montanique. She doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> Because I would like ask the question. I'm like, oh, it's so interesting you think that about relationships. Because I don't see that in your relationship. So like, where where you get it? And and for her to answer that question, it it, is too much, right? So so, yeah, yeah. yeah, I I'm always like, get get curious, ask the questions. (laughs) First of all, that's fucking genius. Like the idea of like turning it back to the person, Mm -hmm. but. How do you not get triggered in the first place in order to be mm. able to have that? Because I think that takes a level of composure. Because yeah. my first reaction is like, why would you fucking ask me that? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like that. Yeah. And I don't think that helps anyone ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's a lot to ask of yourself to not get triggered in a space where you are usually triggered. So I think... Yeah. Um, Okay, so first I want to back up because I think there's like, like trigger is kind of like common language these days, like everybody talks yeah. about it. But I want to explain a little bit about what a trigger is before Please you get do. in the situation of like answering those like baby type questions. So a trigger is any like person, place, thing, memory that totally overwhelms your ability to cope in a moment. <laughs> and it 
sends you right back to feeling the experience of being in a very uncomfortable, very traumatic experience, right? So I always think about triggers as like flattening space and time. Like it's it's like Ooh. I'm not just responding to this question you asked me just now. I'm responding to all the Thanksgivings I've come home <laughs> and <laughs> you and you've said this like <laughs> that. That's a trigger, right? It's it's beyond feeling uncomfortable. It's like yeah, you are totally overwhelmed. And so I think it's really important to know the people, the places, the things, the memories that activate that response for you. Like, get really curious about it. Like, what does my body feel like when I'm triggered? Where does my mind go when I'm triggered? Is there is there a person in my family that I know is going to trigger me because they always do? Is is there anything I can do that regulates me again, right? Because when you're triggered, mm. you're totally dysregulated. Your, your brain and your, like, nervous system are not communicating. <laughs> like short circuit. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> error, error, <laughs> error. And so, <laughs> and so I think the comfort of being away from spaces like that is you know what feels good to you, right? You know what doesn't yeah. feel unsafe. You know what doesn't feel triggering. Reminding yourself of those things, right? So if it's stepping away from that table with the family to get something really warm to drink, and that's the little break it takes to bring you out of being triggered so you can come back with the comeback, (laughs) then (laughs) then that's what it is. I feel like even if the comeback is like after you took a walk and you come back and go, I'd like to revisit that question you asked me. Oh my gosh, Robin. (laughs) That's another one of my favorite things to do. It's like, can we circle back to (laughs) when you were... (laughs) Oh, I love that. (laughs) What's so interesting is like, as you're talking about all this, I'm thinking like, normally, like if I was talking to a friend of mine who was like, I always get triggered in this scenario. I always get, I'd be like, well, can we just not do that scenario anymore? Like stop hanging out with that person. But with family, oftentimes, it's not true for everyone, Mm -hmm. but like oftentimes they're still going to be there and you still have to put yourself. So it's like you are walking into a situation where you might be on high alert or need to be. So Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts for that? You know, my first thought is, do you, do you have to be there? And and maybe that's, you know, shaking the table, but I'm serious. Like I think about this so much as a queer person who Mm -hmm. like, thankfully, you know, I have a really good relationship with my mom and my sisters. Like I, you know, I feel for the most part, okay. It's like my extended family is where it gets shaky. But <laughs> but yeah, yeah. a lot of times I question, like, do we actually have to spend these, like, holidays with the people that, like, brought us into the universe? Like, I don't know if we do. Yeah. And do we have to celebrate the holiday at all? Like, can we ignore it? Mm. <laughs> can we pretend that it's just yeah. another day off work? That we are going to do something that we really enjoy doing? Can we create our own traditions? Yeah, so I think I kind of question, I question if we actually have to be in those spaces. Yeah, so it's it's almost like there's levels. Like, mm-hmm. if it's like a, a nine, then you maybe you're th- rethinking the whole thing entirely. Mm-hmm. If it's a five, maybe you're looking at, like, I make up some excuse where I come in for dessert. Yeah. Or I can't do actually, you know... Thanksgiving, but mm-hmm. what I can do is I can I'm going to come the day after and we can go to a movie. Like yes. maybe like you get creative and they I don't know that they what are your thoughts on this? Like I don't know that the people always need to know that you're setting a boundary. What are your Ooh, thoughts on that? No. Uh not at all. I'm really glad you said that, Robin, because I think this oh, I thought you meant No, I disagree no, with you. No, I'm no, a therapist no. and what you I, just said was ridiculous. I fully agree with that <laughs> because I think boundary is another one of those words that's gone like mainstream pop culture and I hear yeah. people use it in ways that like don't seem You're like that's not a boundary. Yeah, it doesn't seem <laughs> helpful, right? So a boundary guides your own behavior. It's a boundary is about your emotional regulation strategy, right? So yeah. my boundary could be I will not check emails after 10 (laughs) o'clock, you know, that, that keeps me from being frantic and stressed about work as I try to go to bed. That is a boundary. It's personal. I don't have to tell anybody else. I don't have to put some automated response on my email. Like, you know, (laughs) do not send me an email after 10 because I'm not checking. I will not be checking emails. (laughs) 
Okay. A boundary okay. is for you. A boundary is for you. Yeah. You can share it with someone if they've made themselves a safe person to share it with. But like, yeah. other than that, a boundary is for you. Now, like a limit or a rule where it's like, I do not feel safe when people do this, <laughs> that you communicate to other people. But your boundaries are so personal. They're yours. If you don't, yeah. if you don't feel safe enough to um, express that, like, hey, hello, family. It is very activating for me to spend holidays with you. So I'm coming the day after. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot to share, you know? And by the way, that is just setting things up for the most monumental fight oh, ever. Yeah. Well, why? Yep. Why don't you want to be with us? And mm-hmm. what's wrong with you? And who are you? You're too good for us. Yep. And like, it's just, I I sometimes think a white lie is helpful. Like, yeah. I never said to my mom, I'm not coming home ever again. I just didn't come home anymore. Yep. And then I just started making up reasons why. Like, I was like, oh, I got a job in the summer. I'm going to go live in the shore with some random people. I was like, oh, I'm gonna actually going to stay up at college this summer. I was like, I'm just not going home anymore. And I only would have hurt her if I had said that. My new favorite thing is just being like, I'm just not. And yeah. <laughs> not saying anything. And they're like, well, why not? And I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, what are you going to do then? You're just going to spend Christmas alone? And I'm like, I'm not sure yet. And mm-hmm. It's like, what is there to pick apart? Like, yep. there isn't anything else. Yeah. Well, what's really great about what you said, Steph, is that in saying that, you're not coming in apologizing. I think there's a, like, the, 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 the thing is that you are taking care of yourself and you're just saying, I'm just not gonna. And there's no guilt. There's no shame. There's just like, I'm, I'm oh, just- there it's, is. It's just, just buried. <laughs> well, but I'm saying you're not giving that to them. And so there's no fight to be had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I find- oftentimes like I don't know when the age happens where this switches but like I am always the person who has to go to my family oh yeah I've always lived in a different city than most of my family so I get that but like there's also this thing that I'm like okay well where am I sleeping am I sleeping at my parents house like absolutely not am I like going to my uncle's house like I just like all this extra stuff where I'm then like not in an environment I can control And oftentimes I'm in someone else's home. And so there's also all these like additional rules about like Mm -hmm. politeness and like being a good guest and whatever. But then at the same time, the conflicting message that like we're family. And so like relax, (laughs) but no one's relaxed. Make yourself at home. Yes. (laughs) So like I always find that really hard. Do you have any Mm -hmm. tips or like do you relate to that at all? That it's like the environment that you're in is no longer yours. So how do you... I don't know, find like a safe place in like a weird, strange environment. Yes. Yeah. It's the same for me when I go home or home. This is the weird thing. Like I've, I've actually never lived in the place that my family lives now. So that's not home to me. I have like no concept of that place other than like, that's where I have to go if I want to see my sisters and my mom. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And so it's really bizarre because uh, this isn't my place. I don't have like a a local whatever that I can go to and feel comfortable. Um, there's no space for me when I go visit. So I always have to either like get a room um, at a hotel or Airbnb, which sucks, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's extra money that it costs me to like celebrate this holiday with my family. Um, yeah. And so I can totally, totally relate to that stuff. I think a strategy that I've used is I always build in calls with my friends. So I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, if something has to feel familiar, right? So I'm going to FaceTime one of my friends every day that I'm in Alabama. And also something that feels familiar, uh, but away from all the action So uh, I love the memes about like cousins going on a walk and coming back and they actually went out to smoke. (laughs) smoke. And um, but yeah, that is that is like so real. Right. So I've gone. Oh, my gosh. Probably like 10, 12 years now. I've gone to this city (laughs) that I've never lived in, but now is somehow home. Um, And so like I know I can take a loop around, you know, my sister's neighborhood with my favorite cousin and (laughs) and then we can come back, (laughs) you know, and that can feel like, oh, this is the familiar space. I don't have to like follow these like rules of politeness, you know. Yeah, I have like one little tip that I use. I mean, not 
I've never used it to like travel home. But when I travel for work, like a lot in a row, I often get the same feeling that I'm just like, I don't know anything. And like my schedule is all off. And what is this weird space that I'm in and whatever. I have this like spray bottle that I like spray my bed with before I sleep. And Mm -hmm. I bring it with me now (laughs) on the trips. And it does help because I'm like, it's my bed and it's cozy. And it's it's wicked, not my bed. And it's not cozy most of the time. But it Mm -hmm. does kind of bring back my body somehow to like a place that feels familiar. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. I will say like for me, just a little bit of a devil's advocate. I like when I go to them because for me, it makes me feel like I'm in control. When they Mm -hmm. come into my space, I feel like one, I don't know when they're ever going to (laughs) leave. And then two, I don't want them to like wreck all the things that I have lovely memories associated with. Mm -hmm. So like when I go to you, I can especially if it's bad, I and this is a privileged place, but I can pay to stay someplace else, mm-hmm. which means then I can leave early. I have the car. I can go. I'm like, oh, we need butter? I'll go. <laughs> I can remove myself from the space easier than I can remove you from my space. You just made me think about it in a totally different way. You just like reframed how I think about it because – I think how I've internalized always having to be the one to travel is like, you devalue what my life looks like as a queer person. You know, it's like, you think I somehow have like all this income that I can just throw in the sky because I don't have kids. It feels like all these criticisms on like my life that they're like, oh, you're coming here, right? Because Cause you're just one you know, person. We have a you're life just one person. And we, you come here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That kind of brings up my next question was like exit strategies. You get there. It's it's horrific. It's all gone sideways. Like then what? So an explosion doesn't just come out of nowhere. And typically if we've grown up in a lot of dysfunction, we can tell the tick, tick, tick before the boom. So oh my, God, I'd love my that. very first question <laughs> is, love that. can you identify when it's like tick, tick, <laughs> tick before that explosion happens? Um And if you can, like, at what tick can you exit? Mm. (laughs) Like, is there a time before the big blow up that you can get off the ride, that you can do something different, um, change the outcome, (laughs) like not be around when the explosion happens? Sometimes it's hard because it's like it feels in those moments, like in the tick ticks, like someone has a hold of me and I'm not necessarily in control. I'm on the ride. And I can see, Mm. sure, I can see, like, if you use, like, a roller coaster, like, the click, 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 I can see I'm about to go down a giant hill, but I cannot get out. I I cannot, you know, Mm. I'm just kind of like, here it comes. And then I'm going to do something that's not helpful to anyone. Maybe, maybe it is actually helpful to, like, okay, I just need to get this out so I I feel like I can get off Mm. this roller coaster. Even if it's only regulating and helpful for you. So now you feel like your feet are back on the ground, like there the explosion happened. There's a clear path, and now you can now like you can start exit the apology the situation. tour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what happens when you are responsible for other people? Like Robin, you have your kids and your partner. I'm sure there's a level of responsibility there that you feel. How do yeah. you both think of that? It's de- it's definitely different. It does change the dynamic. Like when I go in alone or like when I used to, like when my mom was alive and I was younger, it was like I only had to be beholden to myself. So if I wanted to be bratty 13-year-old Robin, I could. If I wanted to be, you know, like I'm I'm evolved Robin, I could. But I didn't have to be – I didn't have to take care of anybody but myself. But mm. now – I know I have to put my kids first and I have to put Mary first. So we go to my wife's um, dad's house and they're lovely people. Like her dad is lovely, but he's 101. Really? But he's, yeah, but they're like. Actually 101. 101, yeah. But it's like, there's no, that house is like a vacuum. And I grew up in chaos, but we had a thing the first time that we went home I didn't understand what was happening. And I ended up sobbing in the car. I just didn't understand. And I, I turned to Mary and I said, just the vacuum of nothingness. I said, I can't, I don't know how to feel. I just feel 
alone. I feel like no one's talking about anything and I didn't know how to be. And mm-hmm. I just, I just started crying and I was like, why am I crying? Like, like no one was mean, nothing was awful, but it just wasn't mine. And I didn't know how to be in the world. And that was our very first trip there. And so w- we set up some boundaries with each other. I was like, I need you to check in on me if I'm okay. Cause this is not my family. And I know this is normal for you. I was like, this is not normal for me. And I said, I'm not saying my way is better. It would have been horrible, but just in a different way. So so I was like, please check in on me. And so now she she really takes care of me and is like, why don't you go to a movie? Or why don't you, like, she can kind of see my tick, tick, boom. And she'll be like, why don't you go to Target? And I'll be like, okay. Or she'll say, I'll keep the kids. You go back to the hotel. So we've set up all these things to protect everybody. And then because there is also a level of responsibility of, of my kids and making sure that whatever weird shit I'm having, I'm not handing to them. Because to them, they're just like they're in this like tiny little house in Ohio. It's it's their it's it's their second Christmas. They don't know anything other than that. And they like it. So it's like I would never want to ruin that for them. But then that ratchets things up, too, of the pressure of it a little bit. It's just different. It's not mine. I think some of it I I could just like really relate to. So I felt that like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I think the other piece that I just keep thinking about so much is like, As you talk, I hear you trying to, like, suppress, like, a fire, uh, anger, maybe even rage or, like, some kind of outburst. A little bit of rage. (laughs) But I always think about this Audre Lorde essay called The Uses of Anger. And it's like, sometimes anger is the thing that gets you out of bed Mm -hmm. in the morning, you know? Like, anger is an emotion that we get to practice a lot in our society. Like, it's one of the only... (laughs) Like, um, demonstrative, like, acceptable, not acceptable, but, like, um, socially recognizable uh, emotions, right? We have, like, anger management classes and everything. We don't have, we don't have, like, you know, Get your joy, joy management Find your classes. Joy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like anger is an emotion that we have a lot of practice with in yeah. America. And, and because of this, I think it's, like, a bodyguard emotion. It's, like, the first line of defense It's the emotion that comes out, even if there's other emotions behind it. It's the activating emotion. And so I think it's okay to let it do what it does in its first line of defense. And if, you know, if that means like you have to go on the, what did you call it? The apology (laughs) tour after. I think that's okay because you are able to move it out the way to feel something else. But don't you think... I feel like at some point my my anger or one's anger let's let's get this off of me but it, that mm-hmm. feels more comfortable um, <laughs> one's anger it can be irresponsible you can't be the person who shows up at every Thanksgiving dinner and is like what in the fuck like you just cannot be that all the time <laughs> so like I do think that some of the work is on that person. <laughs> that person Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. to find some other solutions to like during the tick tick I like that's what I've been trying to work on is Mm -hmm. like what can I do to like can I take some deep breaths can I take a walk can I step away so that I don't become explosive and and take my rage at people do you know what I mean it's like Mm -hmm. avoiding Mm -hmm. the rage but not suppressing the rage right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're doing the therapist Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't realize I had. A oh, you do. Mm-hmm. As soon as you like, you're, you do a whole. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. Maybe it's like my active listening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I I do um, think like it's really important what y'all are saying. What I'm hearing is like you have to have the feeling, <laughs> you know, and and the work of having feelings is like how to have it in a constructive way and not a destructive way. I think anger is an active emotion, but how do we make it an action that doesn't destroy our relationships, doesn't destroy our personal self, you know, like us, um, and destroy like an experience that we really want to have. So yeah, finding constructive ways to have it instead of ways that destroy, (laughs) because I think that's, that's how we are taught to have, um, Mm -hmm. anger is that it has to be destructive. Um, yeah. And like kind of the, the essay that I referenced by Audre Lorde, like she makes this argument that like anger 
when um, she's specifically talking about um, black queer women, but I I would venture to say like anybody with multiple marginalized identities, right? When you have anger, it does something different because we're responding to something different than like the culture tells us that we should be angry about. So usually queer folks, women, <laughs> when we're in these moments and feel really angry, we're responding to an injustice. We're responding to not being seen for all of who we are. And so I think when you think about it that way, like what's causing the anger? Why does my anger want to jump out right now? <laughs> Why do I want to explode right now? I think when you take a beat and think about that, like you can think about constructive ways to do it. And if it if it needs to be a scream, maybe it doesn't need to be a scream at the table, <laughs> but it could be a scream somewhere else, yeah, you yeah. know? <laughs> I think there's something really valid in like my body naturally wants to do this to process this emotion. So maybe I don't need to do it right here in front of these folks, but I still need to do it. I think that that's really valid. That's how you do that on the cousin's walk. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, fuck. Why does Aunt Jane always do that? (laughs) I'll tell you what I'm going to say when I get back. Like that. Exactly. I want to take us back to the holidays for a second and just ask about some tips for people who like I've been the lonely gal. I didn't meet Mary till I was like 33. I spent many a holidays going to my friend's house or like some tips for the folks who are single yeah. in the holidays because it can be a hard time. Totally. Yes. So, um, again, you know, I'm going to go back to why do you have to celebrate this? Like, just pretend like it's any other day. You know, I, too, have been single for many and many a holiday and you do not have to celebrate it in the way that everything around you is telling uh-huh. you you have to. If you just had this day off to yourself, what would you do? I think some of my favorite holiday celebrations, um, one, one New Year's, I just like booked this Airbnb up in like the snowiest part of <laughs> upstate I could find. It was like right outside of Rochester. And I just spent that New Year's, like, a whole week just, like, by myself. I was just, like, writing, pulling tarot cards. Oh, I love and that. And then, you know, New Year's Day, I met up with friends, you know? So you don't have to do it in the way that it that it's scripted for you. You can create your own story around it. I love that. I think that holds true for everything that we've been saying about holidays. Like, I think that's the through line of everything we're saying. You can write your own script. I really love that. Mm-hmm. I love, like, taking apart Christmas because Christmas is huge in my family, but... I've never had a good Christmas that I remember, at least. So, like, I would always go home when my nana was alive because she, like, believed in Jesus and things that, like, were really important to her around Christmas. So I would be like, okay, this is really important to her. I want to show up for her because I love her. Um, But since she's passed, I've been like, okay, like, what did I actually like about this holiday? And honestly, the thing I liked was, like, supporting my nana in something that she really loved. And so that's the thing that I do now. Like, since she's passed, I'm like, okay, what reminds me of my nana and what makes me feel close to her? I, like, make foods that she made. I, like, usually if I have friends over, like, give them little care packages to go for the week. I make, like, Italian cookies that are from her region. And I just try to, like, remember her and, like, live in that. And it's not really Christmas, but it's like my Christmas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's yes. delicious. You know, it's funny. It's like the way that I've solved it for or Mary and I have solved it is that we've created our own traditions. And we I try to hold them like tight, but not too tight. I just don't want to become held to these traditions in a negative way. Like we're not connected when we're doing them, but like we have one on Christmas Eve. We go to the, the lights in Diker Heights and we go to, we'll walk around there and then we go to... um to this um, hibachi place because it's in this Italian neighborhood and everybody's home having like some big like Italian dinner. So you can get in really easily and we have hibachi every Christmas Eve. And it's it's like a nice little tradition. And we, you know, have like cinnamon rolls on Sunday. And that was one of the things I remember about my mom was that on Christmas before we could open the presents, she would make cinnamon rolls and, you know, was like trying to extend the the Christmas into five minutes. And, and my kids have brought their own stuff. Like they, for many years, Christmas Eve would sleep in the same room together because they would just be so excited. And then we would tell them that they couldn't wake up until six. And so then they, they would like be standing outside the door at like five fifty five, like it's almost six to so wake them up. And we, you know, it's like, so we've built all these things that are ours that have all these lovely memories. Mm-hmm. And, and even second Christmas is part of that. It's like, it extends Christmas. Cause I see the joy it brings my kids. And I love to 
see mm-hmm. Mary's sister and I love to, you know, so it's like, you know, there are finding the joy in the things that are sort of required and then finding the things that are ours. Yes. But but if if next year we don't want to do the Christmas Eve lights, we don't. Like I don't want to hold anything so tight that we're doing it and we're all just like, "Come on. Now we do the lights." But this year we're doing it. <laughs> oh, we're yeah. doing it this year for okay, sure. Okay, good. Cuz I'm picturing yeah. myself in the middle seat of the back of the, of oh, the yeah. SUV oh, yeah. and I'm like <laughs> between the two kids, I'm thriving. Yeah. I have a hot toddy. And then we get the Mai Tais at the hibachi Ooh. place. It's so good. And the kids get chocolate milk. It's great. It's a win for everybody. You see how this conversation is so different than when we were talking about the hardness Mm. of holidays. I just want to to do a full. Yes, and also the two of y'all just described glimmers. Have y'all ever heard of glimmers? No. Okay, so it's the flip of triggers. So everybody always talks about triggers, but there's also something called glimmer, which is basically the reverse (laughs) of a trigger. It's a person, a place, a thing, a memory, an experience that makes you feel so overwhelmingly regulated, safe, calm, <laughs> soothed, that like you have a joy moment, Aww. right? And so glimmers, they overwhelm us with like a sense of safety. So it's like literally the flip of a trigger. And so whether it's those like cinnamon rolls <laughs> on the Sunday or like the middle seat going <laughs> going to see the lights, like those are glimmers. Those are moments that trigger a memory that is a happy one, mm. that is a safe one that you can return to. So we got to look for the glimmers. I feel like that's the, that's the yes. title of our episode is look for the glimmers in the holidays. Yes. Or create them. Okay, so we're going to do a game. It's a little holiday game that producer Maria made these amazing like situations for. And we have to rate ourselves either on the naughty or nice scale. So I'm going to present you with a situation and you have to say, would I be like so cunty, so naughty, or like so sweet, like (laughs) nice. Okay. Okay. Wait, is there a winner? Oh, yes. shit. I love you even more. Yes, there is a winner. <sighs> oh, my God. So there was one time my friends were talking about a game and they were like describing it to me. And I said, wait, but how do you win? And they were like, you just played. I said, well, then it's not a game. I was like, because <laughs> I always want to win. All right. We're enemies now, money. Okay. The win is going to be best answer. And the prize oh is that I will <laughs> mail you cookies. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's go. Oh, she's stretching. She is stretching. We're taking this serious. All right. Okay. Situation number one. There is one chocolate left in the box and an excited young cousin sitting next to you. Do you take it for yourself because you've earned it or do you pass it on? Are they like 16 or four? Because there's a real, that's important. I'm going 10. Oh, 10 is tough. I would let the cousin have the I chocolate. Know, I would too. But then I would make a target run and go get my own chocolate. Exactly. That's what I would do Win, too. win, win. Okay, so both nice. I would talk trash about them later. I'd be like, can you believe that little shit took the last piece of chocolate? And I had my hand on it. <laughs> little cunty. Okay, situation number two. Someone has to take grandma home. Which means someone has to not drink at the Christmas party and also has to be alone in the car with grandma for, I'm going to say, a half an hour drive. Mary. My wife, Mary. (laughs) That's my answer. (laughs) Do you volunteer? Mary has the flu in this hypothetical. Ah. You know, I would volunteer because I prefer having, like, an edible before family gatherings anyway. So, like... I would not be drinking. And my grandma, my grandma always had the tea on everybody. So on that ride home, she would be telling me, you know, that guy she bought is not the baby's father, Ooh. right? And I'm like, what? And, and so I would just be getting all the gossip <laughs> on the ride home with See, grandma. <laughs> my grandma, there was this stoic lady who had no kneecap. And she answered everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's no joy or tea. So, I mean, I'd still do it. I would be at least happy I got away from the fray of everyone. I just was like, had the one person I had to deal with. I would still drive her. And then I'd have a lot of drinks when I got back. So both nice, but both nice because the thing that you get out of it is gossip or brief serenity. It's for us. 
We love fat. <laughs> That's like a middle. That's like a in between naughty and nice. The annoying neighbor keeps dropping hints about coming around for a drink and dessert. Oh, no. Do you pretend that you have a full house and or are going to be away or do you let them come through? The lights are off. We're in the back half <laughs> of the apartment. No, sorry. See, I wouldn't even pretend. I'll be like, now, James, you know you can't come. <laughs> <laughs> the last time you came, Poor James. <laughs> we had to collect you and say, no, like, you know you're not invited back. James, if you're listening, <laughs> James from upstate, you are not invited. <laughs> No, no, that, that's a, it's not a family member. And like, unless they had some really sad, horrible story. And I don't know. And even then, I still feel like, but I would lie. I would make up a like a white lie for the reason I can't. What if they brought you like a really good gift? Like a really nice gift oh, basket shit. with like fancy cheeses. Well, money doesn't eat cheese. Fancy desserts and like <laughs> other I'd be like, oh, this is so generous. And then shut the door. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think I might do the same thing. I'd be like... Thank you. All right. Hope you have a great holiday. We're just in the middle of something. (laughs) I'm not good with that kind of stuff. Like, I end up inviting people in on accident. Okay. You are given a present that you absolutely hate that you also know was re-gifted from last holiday. So it was given to, like, one of your cousins or something last holiday and then re-gifted to you. And I guess they forgot. What do you say? Do you say something? I say thank you and I eBay it. I'm also the queen of trying to return stuff. Just showing up at whatever store carries it and being like, oh, it was a gift. Can I get something else? There's currency there. But then go talk trash about those people after. Money tips with Robin. (laughs) I have not done the return. I have brought the shitty gift back to my like friend circle or like chosen fam and be like, can you believe (laughs) that they gave me this? Like, oh my gosh. Real story. One time, my very homophobic aunt got me a personal size slow cooker, like the smallest slow cooker I've ever you know, seen. What am I making? One with, meatball? Like, what am I doing with this? One, like, because like, you're so single and lonely as a queer you person. You could cut up a hot dog and make those bourbon hot dogs. <laughs> Just one hot dog, though. <laughs> Just one. And it had footballs all over oh, it. Come on. You know, Dykes like football, right? And so I like brought it back and me and my friends roasted that thing for like so long. It's like, where did she even find a slow cooker this small? Like, it's like a palm sized slow cooker. I mean, what could that even be used for? Like maybe queso? Like even then I need more queso than that. What are you making queso yeah. for one? That's ridiculous. I feel like it needs to become the holiday centerpiece now. You're just like, this is so yeah. kitschy that we must use it. I don't know for what. But I feel like to circle back to your like, what did you mean with that question? You should re-gift it to them. <laughs> like the next year, like that would be good. You don't still have it, do you? No. Mm, this had to be like 2013. It might be worth but it was... like getting on like Amazon on or eBay, eBay, finding a new one. Find a new one and send it to her. But here's the thing. And act, like, send it this Christmas, all wrapped up and just be like, oh, my God, I saw this in a store. I thought of you. Merry Christmas. Can't wait to see you. I love the pettiness. I'm I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Definitely full naughty on that one. <laughs> Last but not least, your sibling takes credit for like the amazing meal that you put together and the decorations that you put up do you let them take the claim and the praise or are you like uh what the fuck no they do not get the credit i'm like i don't know what you are talking about you were not here i made all of this no absolutely not I think I might have to go that route too because I am not the cook in my family like my sister always gets like her tins for cooking because she's amazing. She could do everything. So if they tried to like co opt my meal, <laughs> I would have to be like, excuse me. No, like, this, this is was the first all me. time I brought a single meatball in this slow cooker. <laughs> this is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think what we've learned is you're both too nice. Um. <laughs> Winner? <laughs> but we have ulterior motives. Yeah. Yeah. It's like nice with an yeah. edge. Winner for this round is money for two reasons. <gasps> I'm so sorry, Robin. What in the? This is rigged. <laughs> because money is getting the tea from grandma. And also 
money's bringing the slow cooker to whatever, like money's finding, I, your goal for this next <laughs> holiday season is to find an individual slow cooker that you can, uh, yes. I, listen, I can't be penalized because my grandmother's not fun. Like that's not, <laughs> that's unfair. This, this game is rigged. The real winner is money's uh, grandma. Please send me her mailing address for cookies. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, listen, here's the thing. I knew this when I met you. We could talk for 700 hours about pretty much anything, but we could also be talking about our dysfunction for days. I know. But so I I just want to say thank you for coming on to Well Adjusting and talking to our listeners. And like you bring such knowledge and such joy. Mm -hmm. And and here's the thing I have to say to all of the Well Adjusting listeners going forward, your holiday gift to yourself Um, It could be your New Year's resolution, whatever it is. You should start listening to Rebound Revolution with my gal, Money, Dr. Money. I mean, I I can't believe I wasn't before. I'm sorry. My apologies. It's part of the Robin Hopkins (laughs) apology tour. totally fine, Robin. You know, I think people hear basketball podcasts, and if they're not like diehard basketball fans, they're like, meh, not for me. (laughs) But Rebound Revolution is not like that. It is an entry level podcast. (laughs) And it's not really a basketball podcast. We use the WNBA to talk about so many things that are um, relevant to queer folks, folks of color, folks on the margins. So come on in. Yes, come on in. Okay, so like clearly everyone should be listening to all of our shows. So go listen to Rebound Revolution. Keep listening to Well Adjusting. I do have to say, housekeeping note, Robin and Will Adjusting are taking a little holiday hiatus so that we can go look at lights and drink hot toddies. So we will be (laughs) off for the next two weeks, but we'll be back on January 2nd with more help for 2024. Happy holidays! For more Robin, and you may need that, you probably don't need it, but like if you do, you can follow me at Real Rob Hops on all the platforms, all the socials, as the kids today say. Well Adjusting is an edit audio original, exec produced by Steph Colburn and Robin Hopkins. Thank you to Maria Passingham, Kathleen Speckert, and the whole edit audio team. Oh, hey, before you take out those AirPods, this show is just for entertainment. If you are in need of help, please, please, please reach out to a professional. Go ahead and get that help. You deserve it. Well, that's going to do it for us this year, y'all. And from the entire team here at Rebound Revolution, we just want to wish y'all the happiest of holidays. And, you know, as we move into gift giving days, as y'all run out and buy those like winter season ticket passes <laughs> for your favorite W team, we hope y'all are reminded of our podcast and give the gift of this podcast to a friend. <laughs> Tell a friend to listen. I think that's the best gift ever. Happy holidays, y'all.